Good evening, everyone. Good to be back here in uh, Blessed John the 23rd Parish again. I get a chance to get here every now and then sometimes for uh, uh, celebrations of the Mass for different reasons and once in a while for something like this. So this evening, as you've already heard, my uh, role here is to speak to you about the Constitution and the Sacred Liturgy. Sacro Sanctum Concilium, uh, the Latin word. And uh, I will attempt to do that, as you will notice that I will stick very close to notes, because that's the way I uh, need to work. Uh, and we'll try to show you some uh, pictures along the way and uh, some words that will flash up on the screen that'll help us to hopefully guide us along through that. So it might sound a little bit teachy at times, but uh, we'll see how it all works out and how it, how it uh, evolves. So the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy uh, was uh, brought about at the Council, uh, the Second Vatican Council, on December 4th, 1963. And so it will be 50 years old uh, in a very short time, in, in December the 4th. The name of, of uh, each one of the constitutions, the other documents of the Second Vatican Council, get their name from the first words in Latin of the document. This sacred council, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, is how the, the name is there. And it'll get thrown around as we uh, work along through this evening. It is a most uh, wonderful document, to say the least, and it has had a great impact on the life of our church even up to this time, and there's more work to do. Anyway, so it was again at the, at the council, a picture that you see there is of the... Uh, the bishops, uh, in their time of prayer, I suspect that they didn't wear their mitres all the way through the council meetings, but uh, they're there at prayer at this particular time. But it gives us an idea again of that great gathering of all the bishops of the world who were able to be there to be part of that uh, council. No small undertaking. Makes it look like the few cardinals that have to get together this week, small stuff, even though they're involved in big stuff. So. Just a little bit of, of background because there's a very interesting history of the way of the process of how uh, it came about. Much of the work happened long before the council uh, began. Um, I'm going to take us back a little bit further. So the council is set out to impart an in ever increasing vigor of the Christian life of the faithful, to adapt, to foster, to strengthen. Accordingly, it sees it sees particularly cogent reasons for undertaking the reform of the liturgy. This was that one of those opening lines. But I'm going to go back a little bit of history, as I mentioned. Um, the missal that was used before the council was called the Missal of Pius V. He was the pope immediately following the Council of Trent. That missal was published in 1570 uh, after the council and following the Protestant Reformation. Its twofold purpose, that particular uh, missal, was to bring about greater unity in the Roman Catholic Church in the West. The East had their own liturgies. Uh, and again, to what were considered considerable abuses that were taking place in the liturgy at that time. And there were. The history moves on. We'll come back to a little bit of it later. Towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, in some of the great Benedictine monasteries in Europe, and these were great centers of study, the one called Maria Lach, which is in Germany, uh, and another center in Trier in France, and other places of education, there began a study of the liturgy and to go back to, to the roots, especially going back to the, the works of the church fathers of the fourth and fifth century, way back to study those documents again to see what they were saying. And so, a time of study, a background, the, the monks and these different monasteries and other um, people were beginning to study it. The bishops of Germany, Austria, and Belgium and France requested that the Easter vigil service be moved from morning to evening. What does that mean? Some of us here are old enough to remember, myself included, that the Easter vigil used to be around 7 or 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. It was a service that took place with all the rituals done in a minimal kind of way, I would say, for the most part. And uh, 
but there couldn't be mass because it was Holy Saturday, and um, there was no evening mass at that point, and so the first Easter mass was the next day. So the bishop said, that's not what it's supposed to be. And so there was a request for the restoration of not only Holy Saturday, but of all the Holy Week services. And as well, that request that evening Mass could take place, which really required as well the uh, rules for fasting, since um, if you're going to have evening Mass, it's hard to fast from midnight. I guess you already recognize that. I'm a little behind on my slides here, but as you can see, um, that's what we always said. Here we are. The, from the, at the mid-20th century, um, Pius XII published two important encyclicals. One called was Mystici, Mystici Corporis and the other Mediator Dei. And they had a great influence on the setting the tone for the renewal of the liturgy. Pius XII wished to make reforms, but it was still kind of very cautious of what could be changed. I recall when one word was going to be changed in the Eucharistic prayer, in the canon of the Mass. And there was great debate whether he really could change that word. It seems like, so it's just important to realize how tight things were in the midst of Pius V. So, those things took place. Liturgical scholars came to realize that there was a need for a biblical catechesis. And that was a new word for us in the Catholic Church at that time. A biblical catechesis. First, if the genuine reforms of the liturgy were going to take place, they had that they have a great depth and authenticity. We really had to find out what the scriptures were saying and as well what the church fathers said. The only obvious changes at that time were some minor adaptations to some rubrics of the Mass and the praying of the Divine Office. That's that book that priests and deacons and others as well pray, the big books we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, Pius XII died on October 9, 1958, and Pope John XXIII was chosen as the next pope. How timely that we think of those things at this time. He announced on June 25th of 1959, so it's just uh, less than a year in his pontificate, that there would be an ecumenical council that would have, among other issues, a genuine and comprehensive reform of the liturgy of the church. You have to realize how radical that must have sounded to the whole church, including the bishops and other people who uh, oversaw the liturgy in their different dioceses. So he appointed a new pontifical commission, pontifical mean, done by the Pope, a liturgical commission, and the task was to prepare the documents for the council, to kind of do some lead-up documents to help them get them ready for the council. Unlike most of the preparatory commissions, and there were a number of them for the different other documents, the constitution on the uh, dogmatic constitution on the church, the constitution uh, on, of, on the word, on re revelation, and so on, this one had all a lot, uh, so much of its homework already done. Remember, I mentioned how the, the monks and those different monasteries and liturgical centers had done a lot of work. Four points were discussed. Oh, there's the man. Um, the desire and the need for the vernacular in the liturgy. Again, radical kind of thing. Say, can we really not, can we really have another language in the liturgy? Of course, in the East, they were using their own languages all along. A pastoral char character of the liturgy, to really make it something that involved the people. Its importance in missionary countries. And again, that was because the missionary work of the church at the time in Africa and other parts of the world was expanding greatly. And they said, how do we take the liturgy that is completely Roman and, and have it work here? Great questions. And at that time as well, there was the desire for concelebration. Now, that again is something that we are so accustomed to today that we say, was there a time when we didn't? Well, there was. The only time that concelebration took place was at the ordination of a priest. And uh, those being ordained, as a matter of fact, as they knelt before the presiding bishop at the Mass, their hands were tied together. Uh, it was all part of the ritual. Uh, we won't go into details about that, but it was a most interesting thing. Besides that, there was no con-celebration in the West. So those were some of the things that were 
required. Whoops, I think I just jumped one there, but even with this preparation, I would say that the road was rocky uh, in arriving at the Constitution. Uh, we could go into great uh, detail on some of the political maneuvering that took place, if you can believe that that kind of thing would take place at the Vatican. Uh, and uh, that preparation for the council and for the debates that were to follow. There was the desire to show that the documents of the council were very much following the teaching of the Council of Trent. And that was to say that we, they weren't kind of breaking away to something altogether different, but it was following along. And so Trent is often quoted in the different uh, documents of, of the council. This is especially noted in speaking of the Eucharist as a sacrifice and as a meal. The emphasis at Trent was very much on Eucharist as sacrifice. Why was that? To a great degree, because the Protestant reformers had spoken so strongly against an overemphasis on that, much more as the Eucharist as meal, if you will, and other kinds of things. And so Trent was very strong that way. You know, to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, that's what part of the situation was at the time. But at Vatican II, Protestant observers, and there were many of them there, were pleased to see that there was a greater acceptance of some of their views by the Council Fathers. In many cases, our Eucharistic theology and that of many other churches shares a whole lot more in common than it did before. Uh, so it doesn't say it's an either-or, but it's certainly a both-and. The pastoral implications of the council are seen strongly in what I would call a theology of communion. I'm going to move ahead to that now. I think I, no, I just have to stay where I am. Go back to that in a second. And I want to mention that as well because it is one of those areas that, uh, that came about as saying that we recognize that we're not just a bunch of individuals, but that we belong to a community. And this was con uh, really in contrast to what was um, part of the, the thinking pre-Vatican II, if you will. Um, they had a very much a juridical view of things, very much legalistic kind of language that was used in the church as the perfect society, so to speak. The church is the means by which the Father communicates the divine life to the humanity of his Son, Jesus Christ. But in the Constitution, we read this, and it's a number two, it's the very beginning of the Constitution. The church is essentially both human and divine, visible but endowed with invisible realities, zealous in action and dedicated to contemplation, present in the world but as a pilgrim, so constituted that in her the human is directed and subordinated toward the divine, the visible to the invisible, action to contemplation, and this present world to that city yet to come, the object of our quest. And that's in the very beginning, almost like in the intro part of the, the Constitution. It says a whole lot. But what it does say is that we recognize that who we are as church, that we are um, not just a human institution, and we're not so spiritual that we're not in touch with humanity, but it is that great combination, but always leading us say, from the visible to the invisible, from action to contemplation, from this present world to the fullness of the life of the kingdom. When the final vote came, by the way, at the, at the uh, council, the vote was 2,147 for the Constitution, and four against. Now, I think if we went back and read some documentation, we'd find out who the four were. It might be kind of interesting, and um, I'm sure that if uh, Archbishop Hayes is watching this tonight, he could probably name them. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Father Yves Congar on a whole story of that that would tell some of the details. But obviously, a considerably overwhelming vote. Um, and, and an agreement with the words and with the spirit of the document. Again, the document uh, was uh, uh, brought about and, and it was accepted. The first 
document of the Second Vatican Council to, be, to get approval. Other ones were on the way, but this was the first one to get, to get out there. Again, because so much work was done ahead of time. Without going into detail, the road ahead was not smooth, though, in getting to the place where um, uh, it was saying, oh, this, this is the most wonderful thing, let's accept it. Um, there were some bishops and cardinals in what was called the Holy Office uh, that seemed to get the ear of Pope Paul VI, who was now Pope by this time. John XXIII had died. Um, and a subsequent document attempted to kind of put the brakes on some of the work. But the work was being done by a different group. It was done by the Congregation of Rites that got a new name in a little while. The new commission was formed and was... Um, the, this is what the Pope did. He, took, uh, he said, we need a different whole group to make this constitution come alive in the life of the church. And uh, its long name, and it should have been here, but I'm not sure... Uh, I'm, I'm not the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, but we'll, we'll get that to that in a few moments. Anyway, um, it was called the Council for the Implementation of the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. I'm not sure what that is in Latin, but they come up with one really good short name, and it was called Concilium, C-O-N-C-I-L-I-U-M. And so Concilium, a combination of bishops and priests and other theologians who were called uh, to make this document come alive in the life of the church. Now remember, the books that came out of Concilium, I was in the seminary in those days, and they were exciting, and they were alive, and they were really given wonderful direction. It started out as a monthly journal, and the task of, first of all, informing the bishops and others responsible for liturgy throughout the church. It was during that time that national and diocesan liturgical commissions took on the role of implementation on the local level. So again, to have a diocesan liturgical commission was a new kind of thing. Uh, they don't exist everywhere today, but uh, perhaps we ought to look at that again. Nationally, we have a, a, a wonderful uh, National Council on Liturgy in Canada. Uh, I was part of it for a while, and uh, we take turns get, doing the work of it. Uh, Father Bill Burke, who is from the Archdiocese of Antigonish, is the director of it, um, and doing, again, good work in, in making that stay alive. So that started at that time to take on that role of implementation nationally and then in the different dioceses locally. I'm getting to this in a second. A whole series of documents followed the Council, followed the Constitution. Um, church design, vestment color, vernacular for the canon of the Mass. The third instruction that came out after the, after the Constitution recommended that bishops provide leadership for priests and all the faithful in the area of liturgical renewal. Bold things at the time, saying, okay, bishops, now help your priests to know what to do. Uh, I wasn't ordained yet, so I didn't have to worry too much. Well, we're learning about it in the seminary. Um, and, uh, and not only for priests, but, but for the laity as well, for everybody to kind of try to get a grasp of it. The learning curve in the late 60s and early 70s was very steep. And uh, for both bishops and priests, you know, they, for some bishops, this was so new to them to kind of grasp it all and to take it in and then to make it happen in the life of different dioceses. Big, big task, not easy at all. Uh, and they were urged not to make arbitrary personal decisions that tend to undermine the genuine character and the unity of the church's worship. So that was the task of saying, taking this document, and how do we make it work for us right here, right now, with those documents that came from Concilium from, from Rome and make them, uh, put them into practice in the diocese. But it wasn't to say, kind of make up your own stuff now. It was happening a little bit. I recall in the seminary, and I'm probably the only one who remembers this, because everybody else is either uh, retired or gone to the Lord in another way, but a priest came to give us a retreat once uh, at the seminary, and he had this whole book of Eucharistic prayers. And of course, as soon as we saw them, we didn't have, oh, we sort of had a photocopier. I think they existed at the time. Do you remember when they didn't? Anyway, we got a hold of his book, and we all made copies of it. I still have mine somewhere in the closet. Um, 
And uh, it was these Eucharistic prayers. They were written by a whole group of different people. None of them were official, okay? But we were putting into practice what it asked us not to do here, you know? Uh, personal, arbitrary personal decisions. There were other things like that as well. But I mention that not because uh, it was a terrible thing, but it said we were learning to how, how to bring this about and how to uh, take it in and make it come alive in good ways while at the same time following the directives that were coming from Rome. Actually, they published 224 documents after the Constitution. Some of them were like a one-pager, two-pager, but others were considerably bigger. Instructions, constitutions, um, and these were again by concilium, that one group, along with the Congregation of Rights, which changed its name of what it is called today, the Constitution, the Sacred Congregation for divine wor of Divine Worship. So, now I'm at the right slide. Okay. The document itself, um, as I say, it's a prologue to many other liturgical documents and declarations. Uh, when reading it, we can see that it really is a landmark document. And I'm going to show you uh, and, and speak to you about certain paragraphs that I think really stand out, and hopefully we recognize how important they are always. But the Constitution itself has seven chapters and an appendix. Chapter one, the general principles, the nature of liturgy, the promotion of liturgical instruction. I read a little part of that a while ago. The reform of the liturgy, general norms and others, and the promotion of the liturgical life of the diocese and the parish, and the promotion of what it calls pastoral liturgical action. So to, to make this happen, to, to say this is the mandate now given to the whole church in the West. Remember, it's the Latin rite that we're talking about here, not the Eastern rites, but especially the Latin rite. Chapter 2, the Eucharist. Obviously, so core, so important, so much of who we are. And uh, we'll talk about that in a couple of different ways along the way. But the Eucharist as that central gathering of the, of the people, the Sunday celebration and so on. Chapter 3, other sacraments and sacramentals. The other uh, of, the, of the seven official sacraments. Chapter 4, the divine office. That is the bravery, the liturgy of the hours, the need to reform that. Um, the book that we have today is obviously in need of change again. But with all the other books that have to be reformed, that one's probably a little bit on the back burner. However, from what was before uh, to, the, to the divine office as we have it today was a tremendous positive change. The readings, especially in the book of readings that uh, help us to read of both the church fathers and other great documents, besides the, the prayer format itself. And, all kinds of wonderful things happen from that the, of chapter 4. Chapter 5, the liturgical year. I'll touch a little bit. We'll have time to do all of these things now. <laughs> chapter 6, sacred music. Chapter 7, sacred art and sacred furnishings. And the appendix was the declaration on the revision of the calendar. Now, is that so important? Well, if you recall how it was and how it is today, it is a tremendous thing. Probably the weakest part of that is that term that we call when we're wearing the green. That is what we call ordinary time. Besides not getting a good word for that, the rest of the calendar was really a tremendous positive reform. So that's the core part of, of the document. In paragraph 14, of the document is one of those key ones, and uh, we'll talk about this, and, and, and hopefully it'll be part of our discussion later as well. The church earnestly desires that all the faithful be led to full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations called for by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. That really says it all, if you will, in one paragraph. The call of the faithful to full, conscious, 
active participation. Um, and we have the right to that, the right to be able to do it, because we are baptized, because we belong to the people of God. Um, it's not an extra. But the words spoken there, as I say, were, were radical in a way of saying that the, the celebration of the Eucharist and other, other celebrations as well, all liturgical celebrations, we think of especially the Mass, but, but in all, ta- calls for us to be fully involved as much as we possibly can in what happens there. A couple of other um, paragraphs that came from that. In uh, paragraph... No, oh, um, I'll... Uh, there we are, yes. Belongs to all. Liturgical services are not private functions but our celebrations belonging to the church, which is the sacrament of unity, namely the holy people united and ordered under their bishops. And again, to hear a line like liturgical services are not private functions. In the pre-Vatican II time, there was a celebration called the private mass. Uh, we would say today that is an oxymoron. You know? it, the two words just don't fit together. Mass itself says it is a communal celebration. It is a public celebration. It belongs to the whole community. And for the most part, that kind of thing has disappeared. That is why there was need for concelebration, so that uh, priests did not have that need to celebrate Mass by themselves because pre-council, that was the only way they thought it was possible to do it. Wonderful change. Paragraph 26, core one. Paragraph 33. Whoops. Yeah, it belongs to all. There we are. My first, second picture. Paragraph 33. Although the liturgy is above all things the worship of the divine majesty, it likewise contains rich instruction for the faithful. For the liturgy, in the liturgy, God is speaking to his people, and Christ is still proclaiming the gospel. And the people are responding to God by both prayer, song, and prayer. There it is, that two way part of the liturgy. And all liturgical celebrations are to be that. Again, the Mass is the one that we celebrate most, and so we perhaps see that best. Is that um, um, it is worship to God, but God speaking to us. Um, I'll probably get ahead of myself right now, but I'll say one of the most wonderful ways that changed was the liturgy of the Word, and that is the, uh, the lectionary. I'll speak about it again briefly a little later. Okay. So the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy is not simple reading, uh, I can assure you. If, uh, um, but it is still the basic document in the reform of the liturgy as we, as we strive to, to move forward. It is still the one that we have to go back to and read again and say, what is it saying here? With all the other documentation that has happened since then. The later documents have gone beyond what is written there but that's the core, the root, uh, that is so important for us. So it is important to see the relationship uh, between uh, uh, and recognize that liturgical renewal and reform is a continual process, that, that is never uh, saying, we've got it, it's finished. I suppose we're aware of that with our new translation that has come out just a little while ago. Some of the obvious changes that took place, the implementation of the Constitution. The new missile is called the Missal of uh, Paul VI. The missile is given the name of the Pope who's there at the time that, that it comes about. And it was the norm for celebrating Mass in the Latin Rite. I'm ahead of myself on that slide, but we'll get back to it. The presiding celebrant facing the assembly and other churches, other changes in church design. Remember that? Turned around, taking the altar away from the walls and, uh, uh, and facing the people? Radical move. I recall when I was a student at St. Mary's University and a priest, uh, one, of the, one of the Jesuits there at the time, we got a special permission to do this. And it was really uh, kind of an interesting thing to watch this and say, I wonder how that's going to work, you know, all those things. But uh, now we would say, is there any other way that it ought to be? Well, there might be some question about that, but I would say for the most part that the presider facing the assembly is just so normal now 
of recognizing that we are a called community. Mass and the other liturgical rites in the vernacular, the language of the people. And again, uh, that was uh, something that, that we say, would say today. Of course, you know, it's the way we speak, it's the way we talk. Uh, some might question how our vernacular is in our present translation, but that's a discussion for another time, maybe at the end of my talk. Um, also, the renewal of the liturgical rites of all the sacramental celebrations and a renewal, renewed versions of the divine office of the breviary. Those were some of the kind of main things that came right, out right away. Um, I recall when I was a deacon back in 1969 at the cathedral at St. Mary's, and uh, the bishop gave me a copy of what was going to be the new baptismal rite. The old baptism rite, the, the, the one before the one we use today, was not a children's rite. It was one designed for adults. And that is why, as some of us young folks here may recall, that when a question was asked to the child, and the questions were all addressed to the tiny little baby, that the godparents answered for the baby, because obviously the baby couldn't answer at two months old or two weeks old. Um, and the parents had no involvement in, in the rite at all. I don't think the parents' names was even mentioned in the baptismal rite in that rite, the one that I was baptized in and many of you as well. So it was the, the rite designed for adults, but it was used for children. So the baptismal rite that we use today is the one designed for children. And that is why that wonderful first line of the baptismal rite is addressed to the parents. What name do you give your child? What do you ask of God's church for your child, and so on? So that, among other things, is just a wonderful change of, of, of the way of celebrating and bringing it up to date. The other rites, I'll mention the second one. That is the funeral rites, the, the, the order of Christian funerals. Um, the book that we have in Canada, which has some rites in it that kind of expand the whole story, are wonderful. Um, I, I see this when... We have a lot of funerals in the parish where I am today, and um, many of our, many pastors do. Funerals are part of the package. But when people from other faith traditions come and celebrate the Eucharist and see what happens and hear the prayers and hear the tone of them, I say, there's something wonderful there. There's something very positive. There's something uh, with a hope that they give and a commendation of that person who has died to the Lord that, uh, that speaks so well that uh, so... That's all part of what second, the Second Vatican Council gave us that we can never forget. Okay. How about that? Some of my slides on my talk didn't match up perfectly, and I thought I had this so well synced. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's the Liturgy of the Hours. There's those wonderful four books that uh, we priests try to keep hold of every day, and... Uh, use. We're not the only ones. In a, a book that I um, got hold of a while ago, it's called Keys to the Council. It's by Richard Gaiardes and Cla Catherine Clifford. Richard is a, a theologian from the United States, and Catherine Clifford is a Canadian from Ottawa. And they wrote a book called the 20 key insights that came out of the whole of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And so they're what they call ecclesiologists, or theology, the theologians of, of ecclesiology of the church. And uh, they said that they didn't cover everything in their book, but they said these are the ones that they think are the key ones. And so the couple of things that I wish to share with you now, I really have stolen from them uh, because they are so good. Now, somebody borrowed my book and didn't get it back to me this evening, but um, uh, so I don't have it here with me, but uh, if you ever want to pick up a book, say, I want to read about the whole council, it's not the biggest book in the world, it just kind of get hold of key things. Keys to the council, Richard Gaiardes and Catherine Clifford. I can tell you later. In Back to the Document, one of the great insights that they talk, talk, spoke about is the, what we call the theology of the Paschal mystery. I recall, I think, the last time that I spoke here at, at Pope John Twenty Third Parish, 
I think I was talking about the Paschal Mystery, and I've been talking about it ever since, because it says again in chapter, in paragraph 6, Thus, by baptism, men and women are grafted to the Paschal Mystery of Christ. They die with him, are buried with him, and rise with him. They receive adoption as sons and daughters, in which we cry, Abba, Father. So the theology of the Paschal Mystery is central to our Christian faith. We are brought to new life through that, this mystery. And every celebration of the sacrament is a way of a making present of the mystery, of the mystery of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. The two words, again, paschal, comes from the Greek pascha, and that's a translation of the Hebrew pesach, or Passover. I know neither Greek nor Hebrew. I just got this out of their book. However, uh, in the Feast of the Passover, the people of Israel recall that moment of salvation when they are set free from the bondage of Egypt, thanks to God's intervention. And as again, the blood is put on the doorpost, the blood of the lamb is put on the doorpost of the Israelite people, and the angel of death passes over them, and they are saved. Um, and so their ritual eating of the Paschal lamb every year is saying, not only do we know that that happened way back then, but right now, God is passing over and giving us new life and bringing us to uh, freedom and bringing us to the promised land. Um, and so for the Israelite people, the Passover is still their big event. We will hear that reading on Holy Saturday night, um, and, um, or excuse me, on Holy Thursday, and part of it on, on Holy Saturday as well in the readings, because it is so core to our roots, to our, our Jewish uh, roots, to say that the, that the Passover does that. And so, for the earliest Christians, they easily made the connection. They said, Jesus Christ is now the Passover. He's the one who takes us from death to new life. Jesus Christ is the lamb, of the Passover lamb, who was sacrificed so that we can have new life. The other word, of course, is the word mystery. Again, the Greek, mysterion. I thought it had a different letter in it, but that's what the book had, so that's what it is. Um, and again, the, uh, applied to Christ in the New Testament, it refers literally to a reality that is hidden, that is veiled, that isn't completely seen, that is beyond the grasp of, of human comprehension. God is utterly mysterious and incomprehensible, yet freely discloses God's self to us through Jesus Christ. So that's that wonderful mixture of, in that word, that, that there's the mystery of the, the, the unknown, the things that we can't know completely, but at the same time, because Jesus Christ is the Paschal Lamb, then in, in a way, the mystery is made present to us. And so, uh, since in the early church, the term mystery was easily applied to the sacraments. As a matter of fact, in Greek, the word uh, is not sacrament, that's a Latin word, Latin roots, but mysterium is, is the Greek word for the same kinds of things. Uh, visible signs that manifest the action of God. So this term that we may hear from time to time, as a matter of fact, it was in the prayer of the Mass today, uh, and, uh, and even in use in our theological and liturgical debates, must be more than jargon. It is core to what we believe as Christians of God's self-communication with humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. It is the definitive way in which God is present to the world. True, the divine presence is shown and experienced in all kinds of ways in the history of humanity and the beauty of creation and all kinds of relationships, but ultimately, God's presence is shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ and especially through his passion, death, and resurrection, the Paschal Mystery. So, that is so core to who we are. For us, Jesus is, again, the Paschal Lamb, the one who gives his life so that we can be raised up to newness of life. We hear that reading on Holy Saturday night as well in the New Testament reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's uh, one of those key texts uh, from the Romans letter about who we are and how we are raised up to new life. 
So it is a once and for all event, the Paschal mystery. But it continues on through the prayer of the church. The Paschal mystery happens in our lives when we turn away from selfishness and sin and genuinely love others, when we care for others and serve others. And again, that letter of Paul to the Romans, that chapter, talks about that. Now, it isn't always easy to do that. I think some of you were here to hear uh, Dr. David Dean a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he talked to you about uh, the commitment you make when you make the sign of peace. Didn't that scare you? <laughs> I was just watching it on the video, and I said, holy smokes, I said, is that what we're doing every time we do that? Boy. But believing in the Paschal mystery, believing of who we are in Jesus Christ, says that that is what we're called to do. So we wish the sign of peace to the person and say, I'm going to take care of you because that's my commitment. And he went much further than that, as you may recall. So our sharing of the Paschal mystery happens in many ways, but especially in the liturgical, sacramental life of the church. Again, St. Paul says, in, in baptism, we are immersed into the death of Christ so that we may walk in newness of life. Do you not know that you have been baptized in Jesus Christ, have been baptized into his death? So how powerfully when we, we see when a person, especially an adult, is fully immersed in the baptismal pool on Holy Saturday night. Church baptistries that have fonts that accom can accommodate full immersion uh, can be a real sign of that. It's like going from one's old self of dying in a way and being raised up to new life. That's the Paschal mystery. We need to build full baptismal fonts in all our churches so that we can do total immersion. Uh, we're still working on that one. Okay, there we are. Just St. Paul's quote before us there. Moving along, because... I know you're never going to forget that phrase again of that we are called to celebrate fully the Paschal mystery in baptism, in the Eucharist, and in every other sacramental celebration. Another second one. How am I doing? Way over time. The fourfold presence of, presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The gathered assembly, um, presiding, the, the presiding celebrant, the liturgy of the word, and the Eucharistic species. So those are the four ways in which Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharistic liturgy. Uh, again, this uh, important teaching receives uh, more attention than some of the other documents on the decree and life of priests, um, Dei Verbum, uh, the Dogmatic Constitution and Divine Revelation. Father Bem is going to talk to you about that, and he'll explain the whole thing fully to you. Uh, most important document as well. But in all of that is that fourfold presence of Christ. And again, we see that and say, our very coming together, as my dear buddy, Father Basil used to say, you know, first thing is that we come together, or something to that effect. Our very presence here says that we are the presence of Christ. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am present among them. Present in the presiding celebrant. And, and again, that's the role of, of the ordained priest, bishop, as, as the one who... Uh, uh, represents Christ uh, in that way as, as the one who presides over the community and, and presides over the, the celebration of the Eucharist. In the Word, this is when, when we hear the Word of God proclaimed, Christ is speaking to us, even as we hear that Word. How important that is, that it's not just something from the past, but it is Christ speaking to us at this moment. In the Eucharist, of course, that's the one that, that most easily comes to us. We truly believe that the sacramental presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and the, and the bread and wine that become the body and blood of Christ, Jesus is present. So, there's a real development there in, in our uh, theology of Christ's presence with that fourfold um, way of looking at that. Another thing that we need to remember all the time. Oh, there he is. Look at all these lovely pictures. I thought I might have shown them to you. And the assembly and the Eucharist. I had a little talk here about our background of uh, our, some philosophical, theological background. 
that I'm going to touch much more briefly than I have my notes for. It was the whole thing of where scholasticism, which was the theology that developed in the uh, 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, Thomas Aquinas being one of the great uh, leaders in that, although there were others as well. And they took old Greek philosophy in a way of Aristotle, and they kind of said, this can be Christianized, and they, they did it well. Um, and, and it gave us a good idea of uh, the sacraments being incarnational, that is, that it is that very presence of Christ. A development from that that is called neo-scholasticism, and I'm way out of my league here talking about this, but I'll uh, mention it briefly, was one that kind of developed, but it got very static after a while. The, the scholasticism of those earlier centuries, then things kind of got a little bit tight, and uh, sacraments were looked, much, looked upon much more statically, that is, they're kind of almost things instead of celebrations and, and the movement of God's love and grace toward us. And so they got very thingy, if you will. Um, and uh, so they were seen more as acts of the minister in the church, but really not of the church. Now, that might, some might question that, but it was the way it looked like. The liturgical celebration, the ritual, which the assembly gave praise and worship to God, was seen as something almost alongside the sacrament. That had a great effect on the way liturgy was celebrated. The role of the Holy Spirit was diminished in Western sacramental theology. What's that mean? Again, I haven't studied this as carefully as I would have liked, but in the Western Church, the role of the Holy Spirit was, was not really, down, was really uh, downplayed, if you will. In the East, you know, in the Greek uh, parts of the church, in Ukrainian and, and other church, there, the role of the Spirit was powerful and was always spoken of and so sometimes it seems like what went one way in one place kind of went the other way in the other. And so in the Roman canon, for example, the only place that the Holy Spirit is mentioned is in the doxology at the end. Uh, and so uh, it, it, uh, our Western theology of the Holy Spirit was very weak. Vatican II. I think I skipped over that as, more, as quickly as I should have. Um, So the, the council uh, says that it's through the church that we actually receive the sacramental life, that the church is sacrament, if you will. The church is itself brought into being by the sacraments. And so there's that much closer relationship between who we are as church and the sacraments that we celebrate. So, so the source of her life in the, is in Christ and in the divine life of the Trinity. And so that was, as I say, a a theological development that might not touch our lives every moment, but it's really important because it, it, it lets us know that, that sacraments are not something kind of out here that the priest does and gives grace kind of directly from God to the minister to the person, but sacraments are celebrations of the church, of God's people, and so the connection is, is much tighter and much better. Okay. So the church is the priestly people, and the life and ministry of the church is to be the instrument and mediator of the grace of God. It is through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that grace is given to those, to all whose hearts are often to receive that gift. The sacraments and other means of God's graceful love given to us is bestowed through the saving mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which we also call the Paschal Mystery. Okay. There's that wonderful paragraph again. We already spoke about that, but uh, how important it is that if you ever want to say, what's the Constitution? Paragraph 14. The Church earnestly desires that all the faithful be led to full, conscious, and active participation in the liturgical celebrations called for by the very nature of the liturgy. And we are there because we are baptized. So active uh, is the inherent right. Uh, conscious that we really know what we are doing there, that we are very aware of to the best we possibly can be. Um, all of those, those words are so important. We spoke briefly before about the communal nature of liturgy. Um, if you recall in the uh, Missal of Pius V uh, that uh, some of the reforms were to try to bring about a greater communal feeling in, in the 20th century. 
but it was hard to come by. But again, paragraph 20, 30, 26. Here we go. Liturgical services, again, are not private functions, but are celebrations belonging to the church. It's the sacrament of unity, namely the holy people of God, united under and ordered under their bishops. Could they be united, ordered? Well, anyway, it's part of the text. Here's another wonderful term that came out of the council document, and that is that noble simplicity is to be uh, core to our liturgical rites. The rites should radiate a noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and free from useless repetition. They should be within the people's powers of comprehension and normally should not require much explanation. We've got to work on this because I don't think we're there yet. As a matter of fact, uh, perhaps noble has been a part of our newest translation. Simplicity, we might wonder about that one. But I'm not here to judge that this evening. But I think I just did. Um, anyway, but noble simplicity. And again, if you recall the Eucharistic prayer, the Roman canon, that the priest made the sign of the cross 33 times, I believe, through that, uh, through the, the, now he does it once, okay? And uh, is that um, an improvement? I would say so, you know. Once does it, but 33 for the years of Christ, this kind of symbolism that I had attached to it. Those kind of things kind of got getting built up and built up. So, noble simplicity of the Roman rite, again, work to be done. Another interesting paragraph. Oh, here's another one. Again, the place of the epiclesis, or the invocation of the Holy Spirit over the gifts of bread and wine and over the gathered assembly. In the uh, Eucharistic prayers of, uh, I'm just about finished, um, two, three, and four, the ones that we use most, especially two and three, um, the Eucharistic prayers for reconciliation. There are two of those wonderful prayers that are good to hear during Lent. The Eucharistic prayers for special occasions. There's, uh, there are four different variations on that. They really stress the role of the Holy Spirit so well. And that's, say, one of those things that has been a wonderful uh, positive change. That when the priest places his hands over the gifts and he says, let this Holy Spirit come upon these gifts, that, that Spirit pour down upon them. But the second epiclesis, epiclesis is just a Greek word for meaning pouring down of the Holy Spirit. The second one happens after the institution narrative, after the consecration. And there it prays that the Holy Spirit will come upon this assembly and will make them one and bring them into unity and, and make them all that they're called to be. So epiclesis, how powerfully that is brought out. And so I know that we can slip by as we're, or as we're praying the Eucharistic prayer, but how important that we hear the first one, which we normally do, but the second one as well, that the Holy Spirit is given to us and is prayed in the midst of the Eucharistic prayer. Okay. Paragraph 51. The treasures of the Bible are to be opened more lavishly so that a richer fare may be provided for the faithful at the table of God's word. In this way, a more representative part of the sacred scripture will be read to the people in the course of the prescribed number of years. One of the wonderful things that came out of the uh, uh, development after the council was the new lectionary. And the lectionary was the three-year cycle. Now, we may have thought that was always there, but if you may recall way back, there were two readings, hardly any Old Testament except during Lent, um, and, and the same readings year after year after year, uh, mainly from Matthew, but some of the other ones were woven in there from time to time. Um, and so this three-year cycle just broadened out the Gospels that we hear so many Gospel texts over that three-year time on the Sundays and in other important times. Um, and as well, we hear so many Old Testament texts that we hadn't heard before, and again, a great variety of New Testament texts, the letters and the Acts of the Apostles and the Book of Revelation. So that development of the, uh, the new lectionary was one of those great gifts and allow us to hear God's word, how important it is. Um, so good that 
many of the churches, uh, uh, other liturgical churches of, of other traditions, looked at this and said, I think we need this too. And so there, there's an Anglican version of that, and, and the other, uh, the word doesn't come to me right off the top of my head, but it, it, there's another version of it as well that other churches use, United and, and other churches. And they said, this is a gift that, that we from the Catholic Church tradition where they were able to give around to others and how they've taken it with some adaptations have made it used. So the, uh, the, the lectionary and the weekday lectionary as well and, and others as well, but, but the Sunday one especially, the one that we hear the most, was such an important part. Okay. I think I just said that. Oh, this is always a caution that we have to watch out for. Watch, liturgy watch. Our parishioners are watching to report any suspicious liturgical activity to our local bishop. I'm sure that doesn't happen around here. <laughs> However, some the picture I picked up off the net, I thought I'd throw that in there. To finish, in a few months, as already mentioned, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of this vital document of the Church. Much has happened in the past 50 years. Certainly, the liturgical changes have been many within the celebration of the Eucharist and the other sacraments of the litur and liturgical rites. Our baptism for children, the right of Christian initiation of adults, didn't even touch on that one and how important it is, the marriage rite, ordination rite, and the funeral rite, and the liturgy of the hours um, have all gone uh, to uh, sufficient... Uh, changes, and there are more changes will be happening with those again as the other books are revised after the Missal was recently revived. And so changes are happening there, and they will continue to do so. Liturgical ministry has been uh, seen a, um, has been seen as belonging to all members of the Assembly of the Faithful. Full, active, and conscious participation has been achieved to some degree. Some people may have expressed the opinion that there's been uh, some step back, steps backward in these areas. Some may believe that we have gone too far and we need to tighten things up. I believe there's some people on the other side of the ocean who seem to express that somewhat. Um, some may believe that, uh, yeah, there are members of the church who are convinced that there is uh, much more to do for us to grasp the full intent of the Constitution. It is important to remember that, like all the documents of the Second Vatican Council, this one was brought about by the bishops representing the whole church. It was an ecumenical council, council of the whole church, of the, bi the bishops of the whole church, where the power of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom and the dedication of many people, bishops and others, what it was brought about. So this was the great event other things that have happened since then, of books and councils and groups, nothing quite compares to the council, okay, until we have another one, and we probably won't have one in our time, but that's okay. We've got lots of work to do with the one that uh, we had. So we as Christians, as church, the church in the 21st century, have a great responsibility to work, to continue to fulfill the mandate given to us. The work is hardly completed. There is much more to do again, with all the issues and struggles that are part of being members of the Roman Catholic Church today, and there are many, of living the Christian faith in a secular and somewhat relativistic world, may our celebration of the liturgy in our parishes and in those other places, but especially in our home parishes and our Sunday Eucharist, be both our strength and our joy as we again move to the 21st century.